So I'm going to share my screen with you right now. Um, you should be able to see the American West slideshow. We're not going to go through, like I said, the entire uh, lecture, but rather just uh, kind of a summary of it. Um, really quickly, though, before we get into the Mexican War itself, um, oh, come on here. Oh, doggone it. That wasn't supposed to happen. OK. Um, manifest destiny. This is the concept that I want you to be familiar with. If you're not familiar with the concept of manifest destiny yet, get comfortable with it. This is the his to traditional historical understanding as to why America goes west. It's because Americans um, believed that God um, or providence or or the the whatever metaphor the the people from the 1800s in America used for for God. Uh, Columbia, Providence, whatever, that it was the divine being's wish that the Americans um, basically controlled uh, the North American continent from sea to shining sea. And um, that they were destined, almost in a Calvinistic predestination sort of way, to uh, go across the entirety of uh, the continent. And um, th it's this belief that propels American, uh, American um, settlers westward. Now that, of course, is uh, an argument. I'm not sure that it's a really good argument. Um, does someone remember what Richard White argued in his article? According to Richard White, why did America go west? Kaylee. The government pushed them west. Yeah, that's exactly right. The government pushed them west. And the government does this uh, through a variety of means. So, in, in the one case, maybe you have these Americans believing strongly in manifest destiny. In another um, potentiality, you have the government pushing Americans west or leading them west. And then finally, does somebody else remember what the video argued? What was the video arguing as to why America goes west? America, the story of us. Holly. Because the spirit of adventure, and if they see a mountain, they'll climb it. And just because Americans are so awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, to to, to uh, simplify it in one word, America. Um, and that's, that's about it, right? Uh, and so we have these three different options. Typically, I'll argue in favor of manifest destiny, but I don't think that's the good argument. Personally, I believe that um, Richard White is probably closest to right that the federal government, uh, and for good reason, pushes Americans west. And we'll talk just a little bit about that as well. I've got a bunch of stuff here that we're going to skip over. Um, and we'll be talking uh, really quickly, though, you know, how, how does America get access to the land? What's the very first large land purchase that the United States makes that allows Americans to move uh, pretty well west of the Appalachians? I see Abby mouthing it, it's Louisiana, right? So the Louisiana purchase um, takes place uh, in Jefferson's presidency, uh, but Americans aren't done moving westward there. In fact, Jefferson makes it pretty clear that his intention is to go all the way to the Pacific coast by sending Lewis and Clark to the Oregon Territory, which had been claimed by several different uh, nations at the time. And then after the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition, drops down to really two nations having a claim on the Northwest Coast. And um, what two nations were those? Somebody raise your hand and tell me. After Lewis and Clark's expedition to the Pacific Northwest, what two countries uh, kept claims on that land? Kaylee. The US and Britain. Yeah, you're exactly right. The United States and Great Britain both had claims on the Pacific Northwest, and they'll continue arguing over this until eventually there's a compromise where, you know, northern, the, the, the line between Canada and Washington state is basically drawn, and that is the separation between Britain and the United States. Okay, uh, but we also have other qu uh, questions in terms of some of the land to the south of us and how we solve that. And once again, it's the federal government that really uh, you know, does some, some things here that allows for this, this land that is claimed by what nation in the 1820s um, to eventually by 1848 be become ours. Uh, what country owned that land? Spain. Well, Spain originally and then and then Mexico earned their independence. So we'll talk about that. So first question, how do we get land? Um, oftentimes it's in terms of treaty or, or purchasing it. Um, then we have issues that we have to deal with after we purchase the land or after we acquire the land. 
such as uh, what does this mean when it comes to things like settling the land? What does it mean when it comes to things like dealing with um, native populations that are on the land? What does it mean when it comes to dealing with questions in terms of statehood versus territories? And then also slavery. What, what do we do with the issue of slavery in these new lands? And so these are going to be major issues uh, that the United States has to grapple with um, after, or maybe even grapple with it a little bit before they end up getting this, uh, this land. Okay, uh, how many of you remember the Alamo? Okay, maybe you, this has never uh, dawned on you, but you realize it's a, really a funky thing. Remember the Alamo? Firstly, the Alamo took place, the, the, the Alamo was not an American or a Texan victory. It was actually a Texan defeat. The Mexicans beat the Texans at the Alamo. Okay, so there's, there's that. Additionally, um, the Alamo was located in Mexico when that all went down. And so uh, it's a really odd thing to remember. We'll talk about why we remember the Alamo and ultimately what results from all this. But first, let's talk about how we get there. How do we get to the Alamo? So Mexico had uh, a claim on all this land going clear up to uh, Oklahoma and kind of zigzagging around in places like uh, Colorado and uh, Nevada or uh, Utah and over the northern border uh, of California. Um, all this land, Nevada, uh, was claimed by Mexico and rightfully so. There were large numbers of Mexicans that lived in certain areas. California, there, you know, was was known as a, a place that was. Um, well off before the United States owned it. Mexicans lived there, but there was an area that, the, that there didn't have very many Mexicans living, and that was the area known as Texas. Um, and so here's a question for you. Uh, is an area more or less secure for a nation when it is settled or not? Is it more or less secure when it's settled? it's more secure, right? Because you have people there, you have people that are attached to the land, you have people that are willing to defend the land. It's difficult for someone to come in and just sort of, sort of take it. And so the Mexicans come up with a, uh, a scheme in order to get the land in Texas to be settled, and not by Mexicans, but rather by Americans. In the 1820s, Mexico invites uh, Americans to move to Mexico and basically become Mexicans. Uh, and what I mean by that is they are to adopt Mexican ways by adopting the language and by adopting the religion. The language was Spanish, the religion was Roman Catholicism. Most Americans at the time, were they Catholic or were they Protestant? Most of them were Protestant. There were some Catholics, there had been some Catholics from early age, uh, stages in colonies living in Maryland, um, and there were some Catholics at this time kind of beginning to trickle in to, uh, to America. But, but for the most part, America was Protestant at this time. So in order to get this land and to, to, to live in Texas, um, you have to become basically Spaniards, or excuse me, you have to become Mexicans, uh, speak Spanish, um, become Catholic. And so the Americans move in, and they move in in large numbers, uh, so much so that by 1835, uh, American settlers outnumber Mexicans uh, in Texas uh, 10 to 1. That's a very, very large percentage of, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant English speakers in Mexico. And the Texans begin to uh, grumble about the fact that the, uh, the, 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 the Mexicans sort of reverse course here and they say, oh, wait a second you know, slow down, Americans. We don't want you moving in here in these numbers. And, and the Mexicans realize that they're kind of losing control of this, this area and this population. And so the Texans eventually decide that they want to be, well, they want to join the United States. They, they want to take the land that they have cultivated and join it to the United States. Now, of course, how do you think Mexico would feel about this? Yeah, not great. You know, here, here uh, the, the, uh, the Mexican government believes that by letting the Americans settle this land, it'll be good for, for Mexico. It's not. And so the um, Texans declare their, their independence and they fight and at, at the Alamo they're defeated. Davy Crockett is defeated. Here's John Wayne playing Davy Crockett in probably one of his lesser films, maybe one of his worst Westerns. I love Westerns. 
I love John Wayne Westerns. The Alamo, it's like three hours of pain. I don't recommend it. Um, John Wayne was a enjoyable actor to watch. I'll put it that way, but he wasn't a very good director. And that was one of the two movies that he directed and it wasn't very good. It's called The Alamo. Um, my advice is if you want to watch a John Wayne movie, watch a different one. Watch something like uh, The Searchers or The Angel and the Bad Man or True Grit or The Shootist or almost anything else. Okay, so Texas wins its freedom from Mexico after Debbie Crockett is, of course, slaughtered at the Alamo. And um, who, who is the guy that basically leads the Texans against Santa Ana and wins. What's his name? There's even a city in um, Texas named after him today. Something Sac... Uh, oh, shoot. I Houston, know. Houston, I think. Yeah, Kaylee's got it. Uh, Houston, Sam Houston. How many of you have ever heard of Sam Houston? How many of you have ever heard of Houston, Texas? Okay, there we go. So Sam Houston... Uh, eventually becomes governor of Texas and in 1860, so this is, you know, 25 years later, he's, he's governor of Texas and Texas, the, the state legislature decides it wants to leave the union and follow the Confederacy. Um, and Sam Houston was like, no, don't, don't do that. Are you people crazy? And then he says some really, really funny things. He says like, those northerners, they, they are, they are slow moving people because of their cold climate. They are not hot blooded like we are here in the South. But once they get going, their blood will warm up and they will come down and they will conquer us. And so they kicked him out of the governorship and you know, then what happened? Well, Sam Houston turns out he was right. And the North eventually comes down and, and insists that Texas come back in the union. But that's on down the line from where we are here. And so Texas, uh, you know, gets its freedom. And then it requests to enter uh, the United States. Now, um, let's think about this uh, a little bit differently rather than in terms of history. Um, how many of you have ever been up to British Columbia, Canada? That place is awesome. I'm thinking those people ought to declare independence from Canada and then join the United States. Doesn't that sound awesome? We can have BC, USA. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, can you imagine how would Canada feel if after they fought uh, um, British Columbia, after they fought it and lost, then all of a sudden BC joins the United States. How would Canada feel about the United States under those circumstances? Would they like it or would they not like it? Gosh, you know, the, the Canadians might be so mad they're gonna like it jump on their horses and, you know, put on their little hats and try to invade, you know, the Mounties are coming down for us, if you know what I mean. Um, they're not going to like it at all. I'm sorry, a, I have to make fun of the, the Canadian, the, 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 the mounted police. They're funny, eh? Anyway, um, James K. Polk uh, is the one who eventually ends up bringing Texas into the Union after the Jackson administration, the Martin Van Buren administration, William Henry Harrison would have said no, um, because you want good relationship with your neighbors. And so Texas is the Lone Star Republic for a while. Its own independent nation. Um, however, uh, and, and from a Southern perspective, uh, by the way, who would, who would want Texas to join, the Southerners or the, the Northerners? Well, um, I'm seeing some of you mouth that the Southerners, right? The Southerners, of course, would want Texas to join for multiple different reasons. Firstly, um, it allows for slavery to spread. The Texans had slaves. By bringing Texas in as a state into the Union, um, you're adding more voice, more power to your position in the Senate. So Southerners are going to like that. Slaveholders throughout the South are going to like this as well, because now all of a sudden you have free and direct access to uh, this market that had been in Mexico and now all of a sudden it's part of the United States. And so, and so you're, you can now sell slaves there. Um, additionally, uh, with the state of Texas having Southern sympathies, it's going to add to um, a, a lot of the Southern uh, cultural um, 
political uh, power, right? So they're not gonna like the tariff like the North likes the tariff. Um, they're, they're not going to, they're gonna like states' rights and not really uh, federal control and all that sort of stuff, right? So um, it's not surprising that John Tyler, who was a Whig, but from the South that everyone hated, except for all, except for all, you know, he had lots of children, so there was that. Um, but uh, it's him that starts the thing. And then uh, James K. Polk um, brings Texas officially on, in his administration into the United States and it becomes a state. And the question really quickly becomes, well, where is the border of the state of Texas to the South? And there's gonna be a dispute there. Really quickly, uh, we talked about Thomas Hart Benton being the, uh, the guy for whom Benton County, Oregon was named. Uh, James K. Polk, just to the north of Benton County, we have Polk County. James K. Polk is the guy for whom Polk County is named. So uh, yeah, I live in Polk County, woohoo. So Mexico, of course, gets mad and breaks off diplomatic relations with the United States. And we have difficult relations with Mexico, even kind of to this day sometimes, it's not real good. Um, and in the, in, in the 19 teens, we actually invaded Mexico again, good times. Okay, speaking of invading Mexico, <laughs> let's go there. I mean, literally. So the United States claimed uh, twice, more than twice the amount of land that the Mexicans recognized as part of Texas for ourselves. You can see on the map on your screen, all the area in green is claimed territory while the area in, um, in kind of that light yellow would be the area that would be sort of accepted, like, like Mexico said, yeah, that's, I guess, part of the United States, we're mad at you, but, but we accept that that's the case. And so what Polk did in order to pick a fight with our neighbors so that we could invade them and take more land, now keep in mind, Polk is a Democrat, he's all in favor of the expansion of slavery, He's all in favor of the growth of the United States on the, on the southern part of the Mason-Dixon line. So he's all good with this. Um, and a lot of the northerners are very opposed to this, including Abraham Lincoln, who goes to Congress in 1846, arguing very strongly against Mr. Polk's war. So how does Mr. Polk get his war started? Well, he basically sends General Zachary Taylor and his army to, let's say, um, disputed territory. That's from our perspective. From the Mexican perspective, it's an invasion. The Americans are invading Mexico. We already gave the United States a big chunk of Mexico. Now here come the Americans invading again. And so the Mexican army attacks and kills 11 American soldiers under Zachary Taylor in the area that we claim is the United States. And so what does Polk do? He goes to the Americans and say, look at what the Mexicans did. They invaded sovereign US territory. Let's declare war. And so he does. Now, how many of you think that that is legit? Like that was moral and appropriate um, for the United States to do this. Anyone? How many of you think that that is morally sketchy at best? Well, if you feel that it's that way, you're not alone. Like I said, Abraham Lincoln very strongly argued that it was not just morally sketchy, but it was morally wrong. That picking a fight with your neighbor, basically in order to get more land, is not appropriate. And yet, that's exactly what Polk does. So he declares war. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the war. You read about it in the chapter. So hopefully you have that um, all, um, all sort of tucked away in your mind. Uh, but I do want you to remember in the video that you watched, the, the America story of us, all they, they, so they talked about the Alamo quite a bit. Oh, you know, the, the Mexicans take over the, the Alamo and some of the Americans are killed or the Texans are killed, you know, and then all of a sudden it says California fought and bought, and then they move on. Guys, the Mexican war is one of the most significant conflicts the United States has ever fought, period. Okay. This cannot be underestimated how important this is without this war. Um, the United States would not be nearly as wealthy or successful as it is right now. Not even close. And that's largely because of what we get out of the war. Okay, to summarize the war here really quickly, Mexico was invaded, um, and a lot of the players that eventually go on to fight in the, uh, in, in the Civil War are involved in this. So Robert E. Lee and, and Grant and, and um, Sherman, 
Um, and then you've got, uh, of course, the, the, the two leaders here, you know, Winfield Scott, who's known as Old Fuss and Feathers, and uh, General Zachary Taylor, who's known as uh, Old Rough and Ready. Zachary Taylor later goes on to become a Whiggish president, but dies uh, a little ways into his, uh, his presidency. Okay, so um, by 1848, um, we have defeated the Mexicans by surrounding the capital and basically saying, uh, you give us all the land there that you can see in the uh, kind of the, the lightish pinkish color. Um, give us all this land for a very, very small amount of money. In fact, later, we, we kind of felt bad that we had gotten all this land for so little that we offered to buy the Gadsden Purchase right here at the very bottom of Arizona, which really is an amazing area. Like, it's not great. Um, quite a bit of desert there. And we paid almost as much for this as we did for this, kind of to say, I'm a little bit sorry for this. And by the way, the Mexican guy who signed the, the uh, I believe, and I, and I could be mem re remembering this wrong, but it was an unpopular decision to eventually sell to the an evil enemy, the Americans. Um, and I think he was assassinated. Anyway, whatever. So we get all this land. And um, what's really significant about this huge land, you know, gain in land is yes, there, there is some wealth to be had in places like Nevada. There's, there's gold there. There's gold here a little bit in, in, in uh, Western Colorado. Uh, you know, Utah's got some nice places, but not, I mean, it's not like, it's not super rich, fertile soil. But California, on the other hand, is probably the best chunk of land on the entire planet. Like, agriculturally, it is amazing. The whole Central Valley that runs right down the center of California, it's a huge wide valley. There's plenty of water. Uh, you can dig down a little bit in wells. You have to go further down because it's kind of, you know, eventually the water's getting used. But anyway, there's, there's water there. There's all sorts of agricultural product that can be produced there. There's gold all over the place in the hills. You've got a great coastline with ports that you can have all along the, the whole coast, including San Francisco, which is a great port. Like California is amazing. It is incredibly wealthy. And um, you know, just after the land is ceded to the United States by the, by the Mexican government in 1848, um, Americans discover that there is gold there. And in, in uh, 1849, there's a huge rush of miners all over the place, even from various places around the world, coming to California in order to find the gold. And that spurs on the population uh, that is there in California. Um, there are still Mexicans that live there, obviously. A lot of the um, uh, American settlers move in there. Um, and then, like I say, you had some other foreigners that move in there as well from, from Europe and from elsewhere. Um, even some places eventually uh, from um, like China and, and the, the Asian countries. And um, there's so many people that by 1850, if you look at that whole swath to so go back and look at how big, uh, how many uh, square miles California is, it's humongous. It's like absolutely huge. Uh, and they had enough people scattered throughout the whole darn thing to bring it in as a state. And in 1850, that's exactly what California wants to do. And this is going to lead to major, major problems. And that's gonna feed right into what we were talking about last time with the cause of the Civil War. Okay, if we go back to the Missouri Compromise in 1820, right, 20 years before, uh, 18 years before the Mexican Cession. Remember, Missouri comes in as a slave state, Maine comes in as a free state, but what is drawn basically across the map? This Mason-Dixon line is drawn across the map. And the Missouri Compromise states, from here on out, any state that comes into the Union below this line will come in as a slave state. And any state that comes in above this line will come in as a free state, right? Remember that? OK, so draw the line across. And in 1820, we didn't have Texas. And so where could slavery go? like to Arkansas, done, right? It's, it's, it's not going very, very many new places. Um, and so uh, the Northerners were willing to settle for that compromise. 
look at the number of states that are up here that could come in. Of course, the lines don't necessarily have to be drawn where they are drawn. They could be drawn in any number of different ways. Um, but you could have two or three more slave states come in at most, at maximum, where you could have probably five or seven more states come in in the north that are free states. And there you go. That's what the northerners were willing to settle for. Now, all of a sudden, what's the problem? Draw that Missouri Compromise line on over, and you notice what this is here, guys. Even notice the line. There it is. The line keeps going. Texas is now a slave state. New Mexico could potentially someday come in as a slave state. Arizona as a slave state. And if you drew the line across and have put enough people in Southern California, then California is a slave state too. Except for in 1850, California does not want to come in as a slave state, or there's not enough people for there to be two states. And so it wants to come in as a free state. So what does the U.S. do? And that's going to be, I think, the major, um, the, the major wedge between North and South. It's not just that slavery exists, it's that slavery potentially can continue to expand. And in order to allow California to come in as a free state, which ultimately they do in 1850, they throw out the Missouri Compromise. So what that means is that any state now that comes in can choose to come in as a slave state. And so Kansas, very quickly on the heels of, of uh, 1850, in 1854, it says, we want to come in as a state. We have enough people. And so then uh, they said, well, what do you want to be? We'll let you decide. You can be either slave or you can be free. And that's where things got really, really nasty. People came in from the South and basically pretended to move slash showed up at the voting booths and like started stuffing the ballots saying we want it to be a slave state. Obviously, people from Missouri wanted this because they had slaves. And if, if Kansas becomes a slave state, what's going to happen to the value of their slaves? Okay, so if you open up Kansas to, to slavery, the value of a slave here goes up because you can sell the slave here now. You see that? Like the market for slaves goes up. So the value of the slave goes up. People in Missouri wanted slavery to spread for multiple reasons, one of which was the value of slaves goes up. This is especially true for Missouri because they're right next door, right? The, the value of slaves in Georgia, yeah, it'll go up a little bit, but, but you know, you're not going to ship your slaves up to, to Kansas and sell them. But Missouri, on the other hand, they're right on the border. You guys see how that kind of all makes sense? It, like it all fits together a big, like a big puzzle, but it all does matter. And, um, and, and so uh, what happens in Kansas? M the, these Missourian ruffians, as they were called, come rushing in to stuff ballot box. Then you had northern free people come rushing in um, to, to vote for it to be a free state. And then you had, uh, you know, one group attacking the other group and actually burning down towns where the voting was taking place. And ultimately, between 1854 and 1856, you actually had a mini civil war going on right here in Kansas. Kansas couldn't figure out if it wanted to be slave or free, and people were voting all over the place who didn't even belong there. And that's just a little preview of what's coming on uh, in, uh, just a, a number of years later. Does that all kind of make sense? Okay, and so with that, I'm stopping the share. Um, are there any questions about the Mexican War? Um, how many of you uh, feel like the Mexican War is pretty morally dubious? Like, there are major problems with this. Yeah, I think that um, that's, a, that's a, a good um, acknowledgement. Okay, how many of you turned in your, uh, your paragraph, your first paragraph for the DBQ? Let me see your hands. Okay, how many of you? Not quite yet, but you're working on it. Okay, is there anybody who would like to um, take a look? Uh, see how, how how long do we have till class is out? Five minutes. Okay, so we have about five minutes. We probably could only look at one and only look at it briefly. Uh, does anyone want to look at their? Uh, DBQ in class here um, so that we can sort of examine that. And once again, if you think your DBQ is crud, like I'd rather look at that than if you think your DBQ is awesome. I think we can learn more from mistakes than we can from perfection. But, uh, but then again, it, it, I'll take whoever. I saw Abby kind of raise her hand. Okay, so we'll go with Abby who kind of raised her hand. Um, let me... Okay, I go back to here. 
Okay. I'm going to share my screen with you one more time here so you can see the, uh, the essay. Oh, okay. So, so you have your thesis sort of broken down like that. That's perfectly fine. All right. So um, let's look at the question really, really quickly. Not Jax. So um, let's look at the question. The question is this. It's really important that you make sure that you answer the question. Um, and so actually maybe I'll, uh, you know, I don't mean to, to throw him under the bus here at all. He volunteered last time. So we'll talk about Sam Messes here really, really quickly. Um, Sam's uh, con contextualization was really good. His opening um, sentence was a good opening sentence. Uh, but then he doesn't do well with, the, um, with, with the, the thesis because the thesis needs to directly answer the problem. And so I, um, before we look at Abby's, let's look at Sam's really quickly, and then we'll look at Abby's. So uh, th the question is, evaluate the extent to which transportation innovation contributed to American national unity in the period 1800 to 1860. So we're looking at innovations in transportation leading to a connectedness in the United States. So evaluate to what extent that happened. And so your thesis should be something along the lines of because of technological innovation with the growth of canals, railroads, and communication, um, the, the United States, uh, the unity in the United States uh, vastly um, improved during this time period, something like that, right? So um, let's look at uh, really quickly. So that's the question. Um, let's look at Sam's thesis that doesn't quite do it. So remember, the question is about transportation innovation and the extent to which that helps promote unity. Um, so here's the thesis. The innovations, you notice know, so he doesn't say transportation innovations, he just says innovations. And right there, you've already kind of missed the, missed the focus, missed the word. The, the innovations between 1800 and 1860 contributed directly to American national unity by connecting East and West through trade and politics. So are trade and politics transportation? Nope. Um, he does say that, it, that, that, it does, that something does aid to unity, but it's not transportation. In fact, if you read it just absolutely literally, um, the innovations through trade and politics between 1800 and 1860 contribute directly to national unity. So you see, there's several things here that are not being done. The prompt is not directly addressed. The issue about transportation promoting or taking away from national unity is also not addressed. And so when you answer your, your prompt, in your thesis statement, you must make sure that you answer the whole prompt and focus specifically on what is asked for in the question. Do you guys see how that, that is the case? Not if you do. Anyone kind of confused at what was missing here? Okay, so let's now look at, um, at Abby's. And she doesn't have it in paragraph form and that's okay, she has it sort of, uh, you know, broken up in my directions. And, and, and right now that works. You eventually put it in a, in a paragraph. Okay, so first thing you need to do is have some sort of an introductory sentence that basically introduces the topic. This is not something that you are graded on. It's just called writing in general. You don't want it to be too broad and you don't want it to be too narrow. Transportation innovation greatly contributed to American national unity between the East and West in the period uh, from 1800 to 1860. Wow, talk about jumping right into the thesis immediately. Um, so what we're talking about, um, now you don't, you don't have a line of reasoning there, but you do answer the prompt without a line of reasoning on your very first sentence. That's what you don't wanna do. You wanna back up from that a little bit and talk about um, maybe national unity, right? J just broadly speaking, or, or so, something like, the United States, and so, so here would be a, a, a acceptable um, introductory uh, uh, um, sentence. The United States came together under the American Constitution in 1789. However, they struggled with true national unity. 
you see how the focus there is setting the stage for a focus on national unity, which was asked about in the question. In your context, which would be the next section that you want to focus on, and this does either get you a point or not, you would then want to focus on, on the transportation bit. Right? If you open with national unity, now focus on transportation. Um, and so let's look at see what you see. Oh, oh, good here. So in 1795, the Wilderness Road opened up to wagon traffic and eased the route through the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. Even so, it was difficult at best. To the northeast, a push for better roads grew in momentum when the Philadelphia Turnpike was completed in 1794, allowing for better travel. With better transportation, goods were, should be were, not are, um, able, yeah, guys, uh, this is something that all students seem to struggle with. When you write your DBQs, write in the past tense, okay? Um, goods, with better transportation, good are able to, to further unifying the country together. Okay. Um, and right there, you're tying, tying the whole idea of, of goods moving to better unity. That, that's, that's fine. Um, so a couple of things that you want in context. First, when you do a, 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 your context statement, you should have probably two to three sentences for context. No more than four. It needs to be outside the time period. Is this outside the time period? You can nod. Yep, this is outside the time period. Two, does it broadly pertain to the topic? Transportation in America promoting unity, yes or no? Yep, it, it does. And is there something specific? Yep, two things actually. You could probably, you'd be fine with just one, the Cumberland, Cumberland Gap. Talk about Daniel Boone, the Cumberland uh, a Gap being widened in, 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 the, in the Wilderness Road. Uh, something like that would be um, just fine for context. I think you get the context point with this. I think you do. Um, the period from 1800 to 1860, transportation and invasion to help contribute to America's national unity. Well, that's exactly the same thing as you said up there in TA, almost word for word. It does answer the prompt, but you also need a line of reasoning in order to get the point. You would get the point here, um, Abby, for the context. It's outside the time period, it has something specific, and it pertains very directly to the topic at hand, which is transportation and national unity. Check, check, check. Um, but you need a line of reasoning here. You need to talk a little bit about the way in which innovations in transportation, broadly speaking, led to national unity during this time period, okay? Um, okay, so we are out of time for the class um, over by a couple of minutes. Are there any questions before I let you guys go? Um, I am going to be looking at your, uh, your first paragraphs here. I'm not really sure how I make a good comment on this. I like to write on these things with my hand and give my commentary back to you in my own writing. I will do the best that I can under the circumstances. Um, this will be worth 10 points, um, but eventually we're going to be adding to this. So as soon as you get your your, your thesis back, fix your thesis, and start working on your first body paragraph following the directions that have already been laid out. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, I'll let you guys go and we'll talk to you later. Thank you.